At San Diego Comic Con 2018, the first trailer for the upcoming Dragon Ball Super Broly movie was dropped, and the Dragon Ball fanbase pretty much collectively lost their shit. After giving it a couple of days to collect my thoughts and settle down my hype, it's time to break this shit down from beginning to end. I'm gonna give my thoughts on what we saw with the trailer, what I liked, what I didn't like, and throw out some predictions based on all of this new footage. So without further ado, let's get this breakdown started. The thing that stood out to me most in this trailer, and I don't think I'm alone in this, was the presence of animation supervisor and living legend, Yuya Takahashi. Takahashi made his Dragon Ball Super debut in episode 114 to unanimous praise, and his fingerprints were all over this trailer. In case you haven't watched any of my Dragon Ball Super episode reviews, I'll just sum it up by saying, I love Takahashi's style more than you could ever know. If every piece of Dragon Ball media looked like this, I would be a happy, happy person. Takahashi captures that mid-90s hard edge style better than anyone else, and to me, that style has always complemented the high-octane, hot-blooded action of Dragon Ball Z the best. However, the very first piece of art related to this movie that we saw was this. Now Hiro Shintani's drawing of base form Goku. Shintani was revealed to be the head animation director for the new movie, which marks a massive shift in style and tone from Tadayoshi Yamamuro, who held the position since, oddly enough, the first Broly movie back in March of 1993. Shintani's style is clearly a large departure from the Yamamuro designs that the Dragon Ball fanbase has been used to for the last 25 years. However, I welcomed the change and was ready to watch an entire movie in that new, softer style. Well, so much for that, because it seems very clear from this trailer that this movie is going to be jumping around from style to style to style. I mean, as much as I like both Shintani and Takahashi styles, it's pretty clear that they're like night and day from each other when you look at them side by side. That's not even to mention Naoki Tate's work, which was seen in the trailer as well. And Tate's super soft style has always stood out from the crowd, even in a show like One Piece, which had a soft art style to begin with. So with all of these various art styles present in one movie, I'm hoping the jumps from one to another don't feel too jarring in the film, because that was a problem I had with Dragon Ball Kai. However, given the production schedule for this movie, which from what I've heard has been very smooth, I don't expect that to be much of an issue come the final product. But yeah, the presence of Takahashi in this trailer just has me ridiculously hyped for this film. Like. I think I'm going to fly to Japan to watch this on opening day, that's how excited I am. Takahashi is the chosen one, and clearly the fan favorite. The hype and gifts and like screen caps coming out of his episodes of Super, it was unlike anything I've ever seen. Every time he worked on an episode, it was just pure unanimous joy and excitement all around the Dragon Ball fanbase. And now with this film, his style can truly shine. Okay, that went way longer than I expected, so let's get into this trailer and break this baby down frame by frame. We start off with a very familiar setting. It looks like Bulma's having a party at Capsule Corp. And here we get to see Shintani's style in full effect. I think everything looks great here. I'm gonna bet you a dollar that somehow a bad guy interrupts the party and that kicks off the main plot of the movie. Just a guess. Goku explains that he was inspired by the Tournament of Power to get even stronger. And I, for one, am shocked by this stunning new direction for the Sun Goku character. That was sarcasm. We get this great shot of Goku that really drives home how similar Shintani's style is to Toriyama during those early days of Dragon Ball Z and the original Dragon Ball. We then get shots of Beerus and Piccolo who look great with the new style and Bulma as well who looks absolutely adorable. This will be the debut of Bulma's new voice actor Aya Hisakawa. We basically heard her audition tape earlier this year as Bulma was featured in a commercial shortly after the passing of Hiromi Suru. 
but this will be Hisakawa's real debut in the role, so I'm looking forward to hearing her in the film. We also get our first look at some of Frieza's new henchmen, who look like henchmen. And then, shit gets real. The art style changes drastically to Yuya Takahashi. Look at those arched eyes. Look at the arch! Then, we get our first good look at the new base form Broly. Now at this point, we can already start the speculation. Just like his original appearance in movie 8, Broly is being controlled by some kind of device. This time, it's a collar around his neck. In the character art for Paragus, we can see he has a remote control of some sort. So, as much as Toriyama says he's going to be rewriting the Broly character, it's very clear to me that there's going to be quite a bit of direct influence from the plot of movie 8. However, one clear difference here is the location of the story, which has been confirmed to be Earth. So, for reasons unknown, Goku and Vegeta appear to be in some snowy arctic region, complete with jackets that are like three sizes too big. We do see a quick shot of a Dragon Ball falling into some kind of abyss, so maybe they're just traveling the world to collect the Dragon Balls and then Broly shows up? I think there's a pretty good chance that's what we're looking at here. After a couple more gorgeous close-ups, we see the new look Paragus for the first time. Not too much to say here, but I do like his new look. I'm digging the gray hair and the beard, and it makes him look more like a hardened old scion who's seen some shit, which is kind of his character. At this point, we see Paragus pretty much commanding Broly to snap and attack Goku and Vegeta, which is definitely a change from the original Broly story. Paragus tried to keep Broly under control in the original, and ultimately it didn't go so well for him. Also, this shot definitely looks familiar. Aw yeah. In the original film, Broly seemed to be almost in like a vegetative state in his base form. Which was by design of course, because after seeing what Broly was capable of, Paragus designed the mind control crown thing to keep him completely under control. He looks a lot more alert and emotive here in this new movie. Broly seems like less of a slave this time around, as Paragus is pretty much letting him loose to kick some ass here. At Comic-Con, we saw the character design sheet for Broly which revealed five separate designs for Broly. If I had to speculate, just from looking at these designs in the trailer, it seems like Broly can power up, but probably not go Super Saiyan as long as he has that collar around his neck. I'm gonna go out on a limb here and predict that at some point, his power becomes so maximum that the caller is destroyed and the legendary Super Saiyan as we know him is born. So Broly assaults Goku and Vegeta and that physicality from movie 8 that we all loved so much from Broly is totally on display here. He is just kicking ass and punching Vegeta through that ice. Broly will definitely hit that Jiren level of power in this movie, I promise you that. Which begs a pretty big question though, where was Broly during the Tournament of Power? As long as we're looking for the strongest fighters in Universe 7, surely Beerus and Whis were aware of Broly and his ridiculous power. I really hope they have a good explanation for that and don't just brush it under the rug. I've heard some fan theories going around along the lines of like, well Broly couldn't be controlled and he would have just gone berserk and killed his teammates so it wouldn't make sense to recruit him on the team. And uh, I guess I could kind of accept that, but honestly, I would have risked it if I was putting a team together to save our entire universe from being destroyed. Tien, you're gonna have to sit this one out, little buddy. We're gonna take our chances here with Steroid Man. Next up, we jump to a very quick scene of Frieza fighting Broly. This is where Naoki Tate takes over and his style is very unique and different compared to Takahashi. Another question is raised here though. Why is Frieza on Earth? We'll just have to wait and see on that one. He probably just got word of like another Saiyan on Earth and he's like, "Oh shit, really? Two other monkeys I forgot to kill? Okay, I gotta check this out. We cut back to Broly fighting Goku, which I'm sure there will be no shortage of in the final film. And then we get to see good old red hair Super Saiyan God Goku show up. Now this does not make much sense to me. This form is completely useless at this point. The only time it even remotely made sense to use was during the Tournament of Power when Goku was trying to quote unquote preserve stamina. Oh my god, don't remind me of that crap. But yeah, he went god instead of blue to preserve stamina. Sure, 
Well, as far as I know, this fight with Broly is not some timed battle royale tournament, so there is really no need at all to cycle through all of these different forms. Unless... Oh... Of course! There's toys to sell! They gotta sell those toys! Gotta get as many forms as possible into the movie. And look at this! Even Vegeta is getting Super Saiyan God in this movie. And here we thought Toyotaro was just a crazy person for giving Vegeta this form in the manga. Now it's officially canon! For no plausible reason whatsoever. Now come on, just give my boy G Super Saiyan 3 already. Just do it. Sell those toys! Next up, we get probably the most, uh, I'd say, iffy part of the trailer. It's the return of the dreaded CG animation. Last seen in Resurrection F. Oh my god, what were they thinking? Well, first things first, it definitely doesn't look as god-awful as the Resurrection FCG. In fact, that entire movie kind of looks like amateur hour compared to Dragon Ball Super Broly. Like, go back and watch it, it's like night and day comparing the two. However, I still just sit here and think, why? Why are we even doing CG fight scenes in a 2D animated movie? It's just completely unnecessary to me and looks fake and out of place compared to the rest of the film. I kind of hope this doesn't make the final cut. Also, I can safely say, video game graphics have officially surpassed movie CG. Oh, look at that, look at that, look at that, it looks so good. Dragon Ball Fighter is just so godlike. But seriously, let's leave the CG in video games where they belong. Next up is one split second shot that has become one of the more controversial aspects of the trailer. It appears that the revised Goku backstory from Dragon Ball Minus, which Toriyama wrote in 2014, will be adapted for the first time in animated form in this movie. As a result, it looks like one beloved character will become canon in this movie, and one beloved story will become non-canon, which I think is a real shame. Toriyama taking a non-canon character and making it canon is nothing new, kids. He did it for the first time way back in 1990 with the Bardock TV special. Bardock was originally created for the special by Katsuyoshi Nakatsuru, and Toriyama ended up enjoying the special so much that he added the events of the TV special to the actual Dragon Ball manga. As if Goku didn't share enough similarities with Superman, this new backstory pretty much makes them identical. Bardock senses the impending doom of his planet and race, so with his wife Jine, they send their beloved newborn son Kakarot to one of the jabroni planets that no one cares about, Earth. This scene from Dragon Ball Minus appears to be the scene playing out here in the trailer. Personally, I adored just about everything about the Bardock special, and I always loved it as the backstory for Goku, so I can't say I'm really happy about this change. Little naked Goku being sent to Earth will always be canon in my heart. Just like that driving episode. We get a shot of little baby Saiyans with their little baby tails in their pods. This kind of reminds me a lot of those shots from movie 8 where baby Goku and baby Broly are beside each other. And then Goku starts crying and Broly never gets over it. If Toriyama keeps that aspect of Broly's backstory alive, it would be so bad. Next up is another shot that has spurred on a ton of speculation and curiosity, and it's this shot right here. It appears to be another flashback, and upon first glance, I just assumed this was a younger Paragus with a younger Broly on some random planet. But man, if that's Broly on the left, then he's really skinny, and he's dressed exactly like Vegeta, or Kaba, or Tarble? It's just a strange design choice to have him dressed like Vegeta if that is, in fact, Broly. For now, it's a mystery! Finally, we get to the money shot of Super Saiyan Broly, rising out of a pit drenched in the glow of his patented green key. It looks awesome. And this isn't even his final form! That is. That one, right there. We see Broly power up even further as a shirtless Super Saiyan Blue Goku looks on. I can only assume the armor breaks off at this point, and legendary Super Saiyan Broly appears to whoop some ass, but we're gonna have to wait till December to know for sure as the trailer comes to an end. Holy crap, what a roller coaster that was. That was just a minute and 20 seconds of pure hype distilled into a trailer. In case it's not obvious at this point, I'm beyond hyped for this movie. 
The scale of this thing just feels unlike anything we've ever seen in the history of Dragon Ball. It feels like they're going completely all out here, and I can't wait to see the final product in December. Unfortunately though, it looks like most of the English speaking community will have to wait a month before seeing the film. As Funimation confirmed that the theatrical release for North America will be in January. I think that sucks so much. In a world of simulcasts for anime and simultaneous worldwide releases for films, it goes without saying to me that a movie as big as this should have a simultaneous worldwide release. It's not 1998 anymore. As soon as this movie is out in Japan, the entire plot is going to be online for everyone to see and it's going to be damn near impossible to avoid spoilers or even a spoilery YouTube thumbnail for that long. I really wish they could have figured this out somehow and had a simultaneous worldwide release, but alas, that is not the case. Funimation also recently confirmed that there are no plans to screen the Japanese version with subs, it'll be dub only, and that is a big problem for me. So, as a result, I do plan to fly to Japan this December and watch the movie on release day. I don't know for sure if it'll happen 100%, I do have school, so that might become an issue with scheduling and whatnot, but if everything goes as planned, I'm gonna fly there and put something together for my channel, maybe documenting the journey and hopefully meeting some fans along the way, and of course, I'll have my full review for the movie come December as well. But that's a long way off, so in the meantime, let's speculate. One of the really big speculation points that I've noticed has been coming out of these theatrical re-releases that Funimation announced a few weeks back. Keep in mind, this was before the big Broly news was announced. The three movies that will be screened are Movie 8, which makes sense, The Bardock Special, which as we learned earlier from this trailer, makes sense, and finally, Movie 12. Hmm. Now, I don't think it takes a genius to see where I'm going with this one. Two of the movies here feature characters that will play a part in this new movie. Movie 12 features another fan favorite character that has, until now, never appeared in official Dragon Ball canon. So of course, I'm talking about Veku. This fat bastard is going to save the day, proving that muscles aren't everything in the world of Dragon Ball. Just kidding guys, just kidding. Of course, I'm talking about the Dictator. Oh my god, how the hell did they get away with that one? Kids, Gogeta is going to save the day in Dragon Ball Super Broly. I'm calling it right now. Super Saiyan Blue Gogeta, it's happening. Accept it. If you ever want to predict the plot of a Dragon Ball story, it would be wise to use the following sentence as a starting point. Can we use it to sell more stuff? If the answer is yes, you're on the right track. That includes toys, video game DLC, cards, you name it. As I've covered in videos in the past on my channel, we've seen a new Goku form in every new movie or arc since Battle of Gods. This is all done for a reason. Broly is canon now for a reason. If it's somehow not Gogeta in this movie, it's going to be a new Super Saiyan form of Goku that they could sell us. That's simply the way things go these days in the world of Dragon Ball. So that's about it for today. A ton of news here coming out of Comic Con weekend, and as we get closer and closer to the release of the film, I'm sure we'll only be getting more and more Dragon Ball goodness coming our way. So if you like this video and want to see more, please hit that like button and subscribe to my channel because there will be no shortage of Dragon Ball content here in the coming weeks. The tremendously exciting base form Goku and base form Vegeta have been announced for Dragon Ball Fighters, so I plan to have some videos up about that once the DLC drops, as well as more on Dragon Ball Super Broly when we learn more about the movie. So thanks again so much for watching everyone, and until next time, take care.